Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service offers tax preparation for individuals and businesses. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where today my guest is Doug Schultz, who is a fisheries manager supervisor in the Walker area. And we're going to talk about managing walleyes in large lakes. And specifically today, we're going to be talking mostly about Leech Lake, because it is one of our larger lakes uh, here in central Minnesota. And uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in fishing. And my guest today is Doug Schultz, who is the Walker, as I said, the Walker area fish super, fisheries supervisor. Doug, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ray. It's nice to have you here. Yeah. It's on another kind of a, a dreary day, a dreary evening we've had, but uh, hopefully the weather will start turning around for us and we'll get some of that nice fall that we've been hoping for. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into what you do. Um, um, where'd you where did you go to school? What's your background? Are you, I'm assuming you're a biologist. Yep. Yep. Uh, my background, I, I grew up on a farm, dairy farm over by Alexandria. Um and did my undergraduate study at South Dakota State University and did my graduate work at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale where uh, we worked primarily on Asian carp quite a bit. There was a recent, recently established population of, uh, of the invasive Asian carp there. Um, so that was roughly three years there and then uh, moved back to Minnesota, started working for the DNR in 2006 and bounced around with a couple of jobs, uh, temporary employment for over the course of about a year, and then landed in Walker in, in 2007 as a large lake biologist. And then uh, just in the last two years now, I've been the, the area supervisor there in Walker. When we define large lakes, uh, if from your perspective, how big of an, a lake are we really talking about? Uh, what, what we, in, uh, we being the department, cut it off at two, in 1983, uh, give you a little history here, uh, the Large Lake Program uh, was established by Minnesota DNR in 1983, and the purpose of that was to have a very intensive study slash monitoring program for our 10 largest walleye lakes. Um, so Cass Lake would be the smallest at roughly 20,000 acres, and then all the way up to uh, Upper Red Lake, uh, which is the state portion, and you know Lake of the Woods uh, being the biggest ones. So. Um, that, that was established in 1983, and, and since we've done standard, standardized annual sampling on each of those lakes every year since. And uh, we're, what we're really starting to see now is a lot of value out of that effort. Um, having those standardized surveys, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, um, we're able to start making comparisons from one lake to another, um, not necessarily uh, the values of catch rates, for example, catch rates, number of fish per net. Um, you know, those are going to vary by, by lake because all lakes are different and different productivity levels and all those sorts of, of factors. Um, but the trends, you know, the, the trends in the data sets are what becomes very, very important. That's what we really rely on when, when we're making management. There's two things that are close to sportsmen's hearts, and that is deer hunting, uh, the, the, the numbers when you're looking at pheasants or grouse, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in fishing when we're looking at the numbers of fish. Obviously your jobs are more fun when there's lots of fish and probably a lot less fun when there's not as many. Yep. Um, when you've been collecting this data across these large areas, have you used pretty much constant techniques then so that you're pretty well comparing one year from the next with the same area that you take out of the lake and the same technique? Yes, and so standardized assessments consist of doing the same thing, with the same tool or, or gear or net, basically, uh, during the same time of year. Yeah, everything's repeated. And, and the reason we do that is we, we do not introduce additional variability into the numbers that we're getting. Um, and the reason that's important is there's a lot of noise out there anyway that's natural, um, whether it's weather-induced or... Um, you know, fish, most of our gears rely on fish to move for us to catch them. Um, so movement, you know, water temperature, all these sorts of things can play into it. And our, those factors are extremely difficult to, to uh, filter out. Um, but using standardized gears, we at least do not introduce additional noise on top of that. And, that, and that's, you know, another reason why we rely more on trends than we do on points. You know, 
a, a collection of points, three, four, or five in a row, is a lot more valuable than you know one independently in time. I know that uh, the general feeling with a lot of fish biologists, even like the University of Minnesota, is that climate change is, is indeed here, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it is impacting our fisheries. And uh, I know I've gone to a couple seminars where they've talked about possible lo possibly losing ciscos in some of our shallow lakes because the water temperature is going to get too warm for them. Uh, maybe a better ideal habitat for bass and some of the other fish and not such an ideal habitat for the northerns and the walleyes. Uh, when you guys work together with other biologists, are you starting to see trends of this happening already? Yeah, so climate change really has two different key components to it. One, one is, is climate change as we think of it, meaning you know, average summers, on average summers are getting a little bit warmer. Um, and in a lot of cases, we have clearer water because we've done a better job on the landscape of uh, you know, not putting uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and those sorts of things in. We've, we've cut down on our pollution. Um, so by default, that's going to benefit species that um, reproduce and, and do well during warmer temperatures or uh, clearer water. Their site feeders, for example, bass and pike are really good examples um, of, of species that, that really do well uh, with those sort of conditions. You know, longer growing season, uh, you know, warmer water temps on average, shorter winters, um, you know, and then clearer water. The other part of that thread is um, with Cisco is our, our uh, moderate waters or, or um, marginal Cisco lakes, the ones right now where, where Cisco's are kind of on the fringe of, uh, of, of you know, relatively low density populations that maybe used to be really good 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's kind of that band right through uh, you know, central Minnesota. Um, in those lakes, warmer summers are obviously going to going to increase summer stress and increase the likelihood for summer kill events to occur. That combined with um, landscape changes, for example, additional development on, on some of those marginal waters that right now aren't heavily developed, those kind of landscape changes increase, by default, nutrient loading, which by default it increases um, oxygen consumption within the entire system. And, that, and that's the challenge with summer kill is oxygen becomes limiting. Um, that condition is going to actually uh, get worse in those marginal waters over time. What, what's the overall health of our larger lakes if you look at this corridor from, say, Mille Lacs to the Canadian border? Overall, large lakes are actually in exceptional shape. Uh, a number of them, uh, Leech is, is one, uh, Lake Vermilion is another one. But, you know, a lot of these bigger waters are... Have, have large expanses of public land around them. So the, the landscape changes have not been as drastic as they have on a lot of our smaller waters. And so with intact watersheds, uh, the more intact those watersheds are, 75% or more, uh, those lakes actually are, are in excellent condition. It's when we start getting that 50 to 75% development within a watershed, we'll see those potential for, for significant changes to start happening. And then below 50%, or, or, or when development within the watershed starts exceeding 50%, that's when um, we start seeing real significant impacts to water quality and then changes in, in fish communities and those sorts of things that are associated with that. Let's just talk a little bit about uh, Leech Lake itself because that's where you're working now. And uh, I know we were talking before we came on air here that you didn't actually start working there um, during the collapse, mm -hmm. you kind of came in at the end of that. But um, I, I have fished that lake uh, most of my life, and it was pretty dramatic what we saw there when the fishing just about stopped. I mean, it was it was sort of a mystery to me too because you could go out and you couldn't even hardly find perch there for three or four years, and yet those perch had to be there because there were big perch caught. You know, a few years later, yep. lots of them, twelve yep. or thirteen inches. I don't know where they were, but they were out there hiding somewhere. That lake's recovered, hasn't it? I mean, it's doing pretty well now. Yeah, actually, fishing on, on Leech has been exceptional since 2007 already. Um, when, when we first started seeing uh, the 2005 year class of walleyes was the first good, strong year class we had in the lake in almost 10 years. And, and those fish were hitting harvestable sizes already in 2007. And when that happened, 
that's when fishing up there really turned around. Now with the slot limit that we have on there right now, which is currently 18 to 26 inches uh, protected, that's done a very good job of ensuring there's there's always going to be um, those mature females in the system to reproduce, as well as you know being available for anglers to catch. I mean, even on a slow day, uh, I'd rather throw back three than than catch none. So, mm -hmm. um, fishing quality overall <coughs> has improved tremendously. Our, our catch rates are are averaging higher uh, year to year than they have in the past. Uh, and that's relative to uh, you know back in the 90s even when, when fishing was red hot on leech. Our, our catch rates are still averaging higher overall, and our harvest rates are, are not much lower than what they were you know, through the 80s and 90s, even though we have that slot limit in place. So, yeah, overall fishing on leech has just been tremendous. Now, there is rusty crayfish. I think that's mm -hmm. the only invasive species, isn't it, right now that's in leech? We also have Eurasian water milfoil. Oh, there is? Okay, yep, there is the milfoil there. Um, I noticed in uh, in my career, I used to fish a lot on the east side of Bear Island, which mm -hmm. is Minnesota's largest island, I believe. And the vegetation that used to be up and down at the east coast, is, or on the east side of it, mm -hmm. is almost gone. Now, I've heard that rusty crayfish could be responsible for vegetation destruction. Is that? Do yes. They, do they have that kind of impact? Yep, that's, that's basically what they eat is vegetation. Wow. So, um, you know, in, 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 in some lakes... And I think a lot of this is tied to whatever kind of substrate is in the lake. If if the substrate is primarily rock and gravel, and, and cobble and boulder, then you can expect to you know once rusty crayfish introduced, you can expect them to take off and do well. It's, wow. it's just good habitat for them. If uh, and, and we've seen it in some other lakes where um, there's just not a lot of rock and gravel there. It's more sand or, or silt and that sort of substrate. Rusty crayfish are simply present in really low numbers and really don't have that big of an impact on, on vegetation. So Leech Lake is a good habitat for rusty crayfish? Yeah, it's, yeah. And same reason it's good habitat for walleyes. I mean, they, they just rock and gravel and that sort of substrate, both species benefit from it. And obviously the young are good prey for walleyes because you see them cough them up all the time when you're fishing them. Yeah, and actually more so perch. Perch will be uh, stuffed to the gills with them. What, really? Yep. Wow. So... Just talk for a few minutes, if you would, about how you gather data in a lake. Leech Lake is, what is it, 160 miles of shore or something like that? Uh, about 211 miles of shoreline. And 211. Roughly, yeah, and roughly, uh, I think that includes the islands, and, and roughly 112,000 acres. Now that's a big acres. body of water. Yeah, that's that, a lot that of water. That really is. How do you go about collecting data? How do you, how do you run your nets, and how, how do you do that? So that it's pretty consistent. So our, our, our normal year will be, uh, we'll start saning, uh, shoreline saning for young year walleye and perch primarily in, in So is that walking, basically carrying a net, or yep. do you stake them out? No, we'll, we'll do a 100, 100 uh, not a 100, a, a 50 yard transect roughly, uh, 100 feet, um, where we'll pull it parallel to the shore, and then we'll bring it around and bring it up on the shore. Um, that starts in July, and that's 40 total hauls, so we have five sites, we do two hauls per site each week for the whole month of July, total 40 hauls. Um, and in same location, year after year, we always start right after 4th of July, and we always wrap up the last week of July. Um, and we'll take about a week off, and then in August uh, we start trawling, which, uh, you know, basically trawl is a, is a net you drag along the bottom of the lake, and shrimp trawls, or it's just, it's just a small shrimp, shrimp trawl is what it is. Drag that along the bottom of the lake for five minutes. And that's one haul at three and a half miles an hour. So our, our time there is standardized in, in, in both speed and, and then time of the haul. Do that at fixed sites, and, and again, during the same weeks, um, year after year. And then uh, our gill nets, which is really the bread and butter of what we work with, uh, that's where our, our recruitment information really comes from, our age and growth data. When you uh, say recruitment, what do you mean? Uh, recruitment would be the uh, relative number of fish, that comprise a year class. Okay. Um, and then it's not the relative number of, of young year fish, it's the relative number of those fish that actually survived and stuck around and, you know, hit age three and are going to reach the fishery the next year at roughly 14 inches. So um, that, that's our index of recruitment and, and growth and maturity rates. Um, you know, all, all the real vital population statistics that we need to make good decisions comes from our gillnet data. And that's... Uh, Typically, always the first two weeks of September, right after Labor Day, we usually set Labor Day. Uh, this year, we had really hot water yet, 
that first week, so we put it off a week because um, the water temps were above 70. And we like to be right to at protect the fish. To no, uh, mortality is, is guaranteed with gill nets. Oh, okay. um, but it, it's more so related to movement and ensuring that our catch rates are going to be comparable to, ha to what they have been in the past. Water temperature does, when it starts dropping below 70, that's when movement starts increasing. And that's one of the things we try to keep as consistent as possible, though, is the, uh, the water temperatures we're sampling at. Um, so so on, on leech, we have a total of 36 gill net sets. Uh, around the entire lake, uh, we do them in groups of four, so four nets a day, and uh, start at one end of the lake, base of Cabacona Bay, and you know get, and then Steamboat Bay and Walker Bay and Agency Bay. That'll be the first week, and then the second week we'll start in Sucker Bay and then just work our way around, uh, you know, fit roughly four sets in each major bay, and um, same same location um, as previous years. We have them all GPS now. Uh, fish the net the same direction because our, our nets are three quarter inch mesh on one inch, or a three quarter inch mesh on one end, uh, and then one inch, an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and then two inch on the other end. And the reason we have those different size panels is different size fish get stuck in them. Um, so we fish the net the same direction, um, at the same location, you know, year after year. And, and again, consistency uh, really helps keep some additional noise out of the data that we work with. What what determines a good spawning year from an environmental perspective versus a bad one? That's a really good question because uh, you know, a year like this one, for example, where we had a really late cold spring and, and fish were, you know, the ice was no more melting and, and fish were spawning because, walleyes anyway, were, were spawning because uh, uh, photo period, you know, daylight length said it's time to go. Um, you would think that probably would have been a poor year, but yeah, that's what I thought. This yeah, was probably going to be a terrible year. For yeah, but we ended up seeing quite a few, quite a few young year out there. So there's a lot of factors that really go into how many young year are actually going to make it the next year. And that's really the key question. It's it's not how many are you starting with, it's how many do you have left at the end of the day, uh, or at the end of the season. You know, the the next spring basically, um, and and the things that go into that is is you know obviously. Uh, what kind of spring we get if it's a real cold spring for example let's say they spawn at the normal time and then we get a real bad cold snap while the eggs are incubating and they incubate longer because uh, because hatching is based on total uh, temperature units accrued if, um, if if that delays hatching we're going to get extra egg mortality um, fry come off and, and we get a bad cold snap uh, about the time fry come off they have they have roughly three to four days to absorb the yolk sac, and they have to switch to zooplankton, um, which are little mm -hmm. micro, you know, invertebrates. Um, we get a bad cold snap at that timing. You're going to probably get pretty high fry mortality because zooplankton number is going to be real low. Mm -hmm. um, if we get a cold summer, they don't grow as as well. I mean, growth is especially that first year is pretty t strongly tied to uh, water temperature. So if we have a cold summer. Um, you know, growth isn't going to be as good, and, and what we do see is, is, you know, survival tends to go down uh, if, if fish don't grow well in the summer. So there's a lot of different things that, you know, feed into how many are going to be around the next year. And, and it's not, uh, surprisingly, it's, it's not directly fry d density driven. Um, you know, we like to think in straight lines, and, and, and straight line thinking is if you have more fry in at, at the start of your by default, you're going to have more out the next year. And it, it just doesn't work that simple uh, because of all these uh, natural checks and balances uh, that, that, that go into it. So uh, what would a normal, on a good year, what would the uh, length of a walleye be at the end of the first year, second year, and third year? On, on leech, we're looking for roughly six inches going into September. Six and, inches and that, on the first that, year? Yep, and that, that is really corresponded well to year classes the following year. Basically, when, if we get a bunch of them, uh, you know, half or better of, of our fall electro fishing catch, um, six inches or higher, you know, a little bit longer, then they tend to stick around pretty good. Um, Woman Lake, for example, just uh, southeast of Leech, uh, which is about 5,000 acres, um, there it's five and a half inches, tends to correspond a little really bit well. shorter. Yep, 
Yep, and so it's one of those things that varies a little bit from lake to lake. But then the uh, second year would they be in that 12, 13 inch range? Yeah, fall of the second year is going to be ten to eleven inches. Ten to eleven, and then seeing about thirteen the next year. Okay, so, so it slows down a little bit after the yep, first couple of years. Yep, the first year is really the big <laughs> one, and, and then uh, um, by after about age three, you know, roughly thirteen inches are when males start becoming sexually mature. Then their growth rate's actually going to slow down a little bit because they're putting energy into reproduction instead of getting bigger. That's when we'll see males and females start to grow at different rates until the females mature at roughly 18, 19 inches. And then their growth rates year to year, the increments slow are going down. to slow down also. Okay. So um, you're looking at a pretty good population now. Um, I know there was a lot of controversy for the, t the period where there was about four years where fishing was really tough there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people blamed a lot of this on cormorants. Mm -hmm. And there, I know there's been a real significant harvest of cormorants. Do you, do you think there's data to show that there was a correlation between those populations falling and cormorants, or is that still a little gray? Uh, so the background on this, Ray, is uh, you know, the cormorant population reestablished on Leach in 1998. And, and cormorants were, were historically, you know, not only native, but extremely abundant up here. Uh, if you go back to the historical records, uh, you know, roughly European sediment time, a number of accounts of, of really high cormorant numbers in northern Minnesota. Um, Post-European settlement uh, between, uh, you know, just being generally targeted and then also, uh, you know, the use of DDT after World War II really knocked continental populations down. Uh, DDT was banned in the 70s. Uh, cormorants were also added to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1972. That basically afforded them protection it, it, into two places they were getting hit hardest. And uh, slowly over time, the continental populations have rebounded. And more so in the 1990s uh, when they really started taking off and doing well. Uh, a lot of that was probably tied to aquaculture in the south and, and basically it, extra available food source in the winter in, in the wintering grounds. Um, so cormorants reestablished on leach in 1998 and the population really started to take off at an exponential rate um, in in 2002 and to our surprise in 2004 it really took off and um, the evidence we had at the time suggested cormorants might be having an effect one of the one of the limiting factors with all that was we didn't have a lot of, a lot of examples around the country to draw from um, where this has occurred elsewhere, and, and that's something we do a lot of. We think we have a problem. We'll we'll dig into the literature and and, and see if there's other places with examples that we could use to to help draw some inferences on what's going on. So at the time there wasn't a lot of that out there. Um, in 2004, when the population peaked at 10,000 birds in the fall. Um, we worked with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe because that's where the birds are nesting is on tribal property on the island. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who is basically the administering agent of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, to initiate a, a resource depredation order, which allowed us to start controlling cormorants in, in 2005. Uh, one of the things that was tied to that depredation order was funding for diet work. And so we, we looked at cormorant diets in, uh, throughout 2005 to 2007, throughout the entire season. And then also again in, in 2010, the band did that, I believe, independently, sought independent funding to do that. And basically what we saw is, uh, you know, perch made up roughly 60 to 70 percent of the diets. Uh, Cisco or Tulabi, when available, are, are actually probably a preferred diet item, they're real high caloric content, a really good food source for them, just like they are for, for any other predator in the system. Um, Cisco can actually buffer predation on, on other species when they're available. Uh, so, so perch were 60 to 7 percent of the diet, Cisco were up to 50 percent of the diet in a given year uh, when, when the right size was out there for them. And then uh, walleye was actually only uh, uh, roughly 3 to 6 percent of the diet, uh, and again, this is by weight, but three to six percent, three to seven percent of the diet by weight uh, during a given year. That said, um, hindsight, uh, did some, I, I personally did extra modeling last year, uh, started looking at this in more detail, and we, we basically restructured 
those walleye year classes from age three working backwards. And uh, what, what that uh, effort showed was cormorant predation on one and two year old walleyes that should have otherwise been recruited to the population. Uh, mortality was probably higher on those because of cormorant predation. So it did have some. There. So yes. <clears throat> so lo very long-winded answer here, but um, to give everybody a, an appropriate perspective, um, yes. What what we saw was was cormorant predation during the 2000s, 2001 especially through uh, roughly 2005. Cormorant predation was significant and, and certainly implicates that was that was the cause of changes in the walleye population. We're down to about a minute. Okay. Uh, but you uh, are working on whether or not to raise the slot Correct. because you've got uh, an 18 inch slot now and I know you've had some meetings on this. Mm -hmm. When do you plan to make some kind of decision about that? Uh, right now the recommendations move forward that, that we'll move ahead with the 20 to 26 inch slot limit starting next year. Okay. Um, still needs to be approved down in St. Paul. Uh, that should be uh, firmed up here by the end of November. And part of that rationale is that you think there's getting to be maybe too many of that biomass of that size. Is that a fact? We, we've exceeded our we've ex exceeded our management objective, um, which you know, if you track Red Lake uh, and Red Lake, that puts them in a surplus mode, is what they refer to it as, and we're in a similar situation here. And then we're also seeing you know perch are, are really taking the shorts right now with all the walleyes we have in the system. Wow. So. We're going we're gonna to relax that slot limit up a little bit, see if we can find a better balance. Well, we've run out of time, I, and I haven't run out of questions. But yeah, I've run out of time. I haven't run out of answers. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is Leech Lake is doing well. Leech it's Lake rebounding is... well, and uh, it's uh, a good sign of things to come. Yeah, so. it, it's doing exceptional right now. Great. It's a great fishery. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Doug. Yeah, thanks so much for the information. Having... You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.